Hello and welcome to today's service. My name is Fiona and I'm one of the team at Grace Church. If you're new or visiting us today, you're especially welcome. You can find out more about us on our website, which is www.gracechurch.se. And you can also contact us at hey at gracechurch.se. So today, Ross will be leading us in worship and then Phil will be speaking to us from our new series, which is called People of the Resurrection. And today the sermon is about new creation. So enjoy the service and have a wonderful day. Hey, it's time for the get to know you segment of church. I'm going to ask you a few questions. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. Who are you and where are you from? My name is Karen and I am from Stockholm. So what do you do for work? Uh, for work, I'm an executive assistant to the CEO of DHL Global Forwarding. So when you're ordering stuff online, make sure you pick DHL, not plus me. And then question three, what is your favorite thing about Stockholm? Uh, my favorite thing is the new garden. The, the, you know, where they have Skansen and there's just a lot of beautiful nature and we were at the last summer and it was just beautiful. Number four, hmm? what was the best book you've ever read? Uh, probably Lord of the Rings trilogy. I also love The Hunger Games. Number five, what's the most embarrassing story? Why would I want to talk about that here? <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't know if any specific story. Um, We've had a lot of worker guys in the house the past six months, and I'm sure that they've seen me in my robe, you know, in the morning, and my hair, you know, not combed and stuff. That was, that's been pretty embarrassing. I think that's it. Mm. Hey, church. Hope you're well. Good to see you through the camera. And um, we're going to get straight into it uh, with some worship today. Uh, let's just start by uh, with a word, word of prayer. Uh, thank you, Lord Jesus, for today. Um, thank you, God, for all that you've done for us and um, that we worship you for. Thank you for who you are, uh, our Saviour, our Creator, our Father, um, and for what you've done, Lord. Your uh, death and resurrection from the cross um, that saves us from our sin and how you choose to love us, Lord. Um, thank you, Father, for all that you've done. Uh, and we choose here today to worship you, to declare your praise. And we just invite you. Um, yeah, to speak to us uh, and to yeah be be present with us as we sing. Uh, thank you, Jesus. Amen. Great. Uh, we're gonna sing and um, see his body breaking.
mercy never fails me through all my days I've been held in your hands from the moment that I wake up until I lay in my head I will sing the goodness of God let's sing that again I love you Lord Though your mercy never fails me All my days I've been held in your hands From the moment that I wake up Until I lay my head I will sing the goodness of God And all my life you have been fair We are reading 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 11 to 21. It says, Therefore, because we know the fear of the Lord, we try to persuade people, but we are well known to God. And I hope we are well known to your, conscious, to your consciences too. We are not trying to commend ourselves to you again but are giving you an opportunity to be proud of us so that you may be able to answer those who take pride in outward appearance and not in what is in the heart. For if we are out of our mind, it is for God. If we are of sound mind, it is for you. For the love of Christ control us, since we have concluded this, that Christ died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, so that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised. So then, 
From now on, we acknowledge no one from an outward human point of view, even though we have known Christ from such a human point of view, now we do not know him in that way any longer. So then, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. What is old has passed away. Look, what is new has come. And all these things are from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and who has given us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words, in Christ, God was, reconcil was reconciling the world to himself, not counting people's trespasses against them, and he has given us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, although God were making his plea through us. We plead with you on Christ's behalf. Be reconciled to God. God made the one who did God made the one who did not know sin to be sin for us, so that in him we would become the righteousness of God. Amen. Hi church. Uh, we're gonna be uh, exploring the resurrection. We're going to be exploring the, the consequences, the impact, the implications, the knock-on effect of the resurrection over the next few weeks. And then we're going to look at what it means to be a people of the Spirit. So we're people of the resurrection. What does that mean? What does that look like? What, what change should that make in us? And then we're going to be people of the Spirit from Pentecost onwards through to the summer. We're going to explore what does it mean to be a Spirit-filled people with the power of the Spirit of God in us to help us uh, what does that look like? What does that mean? How do we live differently in the light of all of those things? So really excited um, to be digging into these beautiful, amazing truths with you and would love for you to just engage with us, to ask questions, to uh, follow up in your prayers and in your reading, to share thoughts and uh, quotes that you might have, that just songs that come to mind, psalms that, that it says that... Um, when we come together, and even if we can't come together, every one of us has something to bring for the worship of the church that will build us up, will strengthen us. And so I just want to um, encourage you and ask you, uh, please contribute. Please don't be, uh, this is not a TV program. Uh, we don't just watching. Uh, we do want you to to contribute so um, you can share it in a message or you could record something and we can include that in our church's uh, sharing of the word and of the ministry of what the spirit has done in us through Jesus Christ uh, with one another so please uh, we would love to hear from you and have your uh, involvement as we move forward and dig into these truths together so today um, we're going to be looking, as, as Gilbert has read, from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, and we're looking at what it means to be new creation. So, as Christians, we like to say the resurrection of Jesus on the third day changed everything. But what exactly did it change? Uh, the simplest thing is to say it means that death is not the end, and that there is hope beyond the grave. There is life to come. That in itself is huge. This glorious future hope is the hope that we will profess on the day we die and the hope we hope that those we leave behind will hold on to. But it is a future hope. A hope not for this day, but for eternity to come. As Paul says just in the end of uh, the previous chapter, he said this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. We have this eternal hope, the unseen, not there yet, not in our range of vision now, but will be one day. And we have this glorious future hope and that helps us now. But is there more to it than that? Certainly that hope shines throughout the pages of uh, throughout the history of the early church the pages of these letters and ends the new testament ends with this glorious vision of a renewed earth and the heavens once more in harmony in the presence of its creator and king the hope of heaven is a powerful thing yet that is not all 
that the New Testament teaches us about the resurrection. It's not just as people accuse us of, of pie in the sky when you die. In fact, it makes claims not just about the future, but about the present, about today, about you, about your purpose, your identity, your power, your life here, now. In the middle of the passage that we read, 2 Corinthians 5, 11 to 21, in the middle of the passage is a conclusion. Paul says it. Did you notice it? And it's a pivot point. It explains, Paul says, why I think and act and speak the way I do. This conclusion Paul, from Paul ripples out into every area of life. And the implications of this conclusion are such that we shouldn't ignore them. And in fact, if we let them, if we follow them, if we follow the logic of this conclusion, it will change your life in the way that it changed Paul's. So let's take a look at Paul's conclusion. You'll find it in verses 14 and 15. He says this, We have concluded this, that one has died for all, therefore all have died. And he died for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. All right, let's break it down. One has died for all, okay? Jesus has died for all. This chimes with favorite verses like John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There's something here for the world, for everyone, for, for all. Christ stood, hung, and died as the representative of, of all people. And that, that Christ died is repeated three times in those two verses. Did you see it? Died for all, died for all, who for their sake died. And this death is then put in very clear terms in verse 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin. So Paul is saying that Jesus died for all people and for their sake, for them. But the innocent one, the pure one, the one who didn't know sin, Jesus Christ, was made to be sin. Why? So that, says uh, 17, I think 18, that God would not count their trespasses, their sins, against them. Your sins would not be counted against you, but they would instead be counted against him. He takes your debts and pays them for you. The wages due to you, death, is collected by Christ. He dies as for all. Only a human could stand in our place. Only God could carry the world. Jesus, the God-man, the Son of God, hangs on the cross. But then Paul says something a little unexpected. If Christ has died in our place, then you'd expect him to be able to, to then say, well, he died so you don't have to, so you won't die. But that's not what Paul says. He says, one has died for all, therefore all have died. How's that possible? How is the death of Christ also my death and your death? What on earth or heaven is going on? If Christ was indeed our representative, there in our place and on our behalf, then we need to know that God himself is voluntarily bearing the curse of sin, the penalty sin and the forsakenness of sin in himself. The judgment of holiness on sin, that it is cursed, forsaken and death, Christ carries that judgment to the grave. That's the love of Christ. That's the grace of God. That's his mercy on you, a sinner. You were in debt and he paid the bill. You were cursed, but he took the blow. You were forsaken, but he took the rejection and was cast out outside the city. Why would he do that for your sake? For love, because of love, because the love of God seeks to rescue, redeem, ransom, because sin needs defeating and death needs overcoming and hope needs restoring, because from the creation of the world, God has loved what he has made and has loved you and all those that bear his image. So if he really is 
carrying your sin there. It is in a way, Paul says, as if you died too. More than a few of us don't think there's too much or that wrong with the old. We'd rather think it needs adjusting, tweaking, improving, not killing and resurrecting. We'd like to self-improve, help ourselves, but God is less interested in improving you than he is in reconciling you. Sin has made us estranged from God. We are, if you like, gone through a painful divorce. We are not at peace. We have fight. We have squabbled. We have, we have complained and resisted and rejected. We have rejected his advances and we have uh, sought to carve out our own space. We're not at peace. We're not friends of his because we have no regard for him. We instead have been, verse 15, living for ourselves. But Paul says the first thing we need is to be reconciled to God. And so he says, we implore you, we implore you, we plead with you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. In chapter six, he goes on to say, behold, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. We're in a time, an age, an era, an opportunity when the message is available. The opportunity is here. We can heed the call and respond to the cry or not. This life is, the, this life that we have right now, when we do not know how long it will be, is the time, is the day, is the favorable time. There is no better time to respond to Jesus than now. Yet, yet the reconciliation of the cross and the resurrection go hand in hand, because only those who've died can be resurrected. Only those who've died to the old can experience the new, which is exactly what Paul says in verse 17. He says in this glorious verse, therefore, if anyone, anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, behold, the new has come. Only those who by faith are with Christ on the cross can be with him in the resurrection. They can truly say the old has passed away and died. They can say, look, something new has come. I am a new creation. Or as Jesus said, they've been born again. Repentance is a death to the old. It's it's not just a saying sorry. It's not just saying you caught me. My bad, you caught me out and yeah, yeah, I was doing it wrong and sorry. It's not like that. Re- repentance is, is I, I want nothing more to do with my old life. I, I want to reject it completely. I'm renouncing it. It was death to me. I want no more of it. I don't want to ever go there again. I, 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 I've turned my back on it. I turned my back to those things, to that way, to those attitudes, to that approach, to those words. I turn my back on it and I don't want to look at it again. Have you renounced your sin? Have you repented and died to your old ways? Or are you still sort of saying, well, I haven't really. I'm just saying sorry every time I do them. We need to turn our back on them. Have you by faith said, Jesus, Thank you for taking those things to the cross for me. And they're dying for me, but there I will die to them. I will die to those things. I will be there and I will die to those things. But Christ did not just die for our sake, because this is supposed to be about the resurrection, right? He said he was raised for our sake too. As Christians, we can sometimes be accused and quite perhaps quite fairly of getting a little bit stuck on the old part our focus is always on the old on the old sins our focus is always on the bad now it's true you can't appreciate the new until you've let go of the old we have to know what we're turning our back on to we have to know it and, and feel it and want to 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 long to to be free from that and therefore cry out to the one who can free us 
but it is the new that is ahead of us that was the motivating and has the, has the power. So as Christians, we don't want to always harp on about sin and the old. The appeal here is this. It, this is the appeal here is, why would you love the old that brings you death when you can have the new that brings you life? Why would you have this? Why would you have this when you can have him? Don't you want the new? Don't you want to be reconciled to God? Don't you want to be free of all that? Don't you yearn and long for something better? Don't you long for there to be peace on earth and goodwill to all men? Don't you want there to be a glorious future and an empowered and transformed present? Don't you want the riches of heaven? Don't you want the lavishness of the love of God in your life? Don't you want the fullness of him poured out for you? Don't you want that? Don't you want him and all that he has for you? Ah, yes, you might say. But you know what? Right now, I don't feel very transformed. Last night, I sinned. This morning, I'm grumpy. I'm fed up. I feel just as old flesh as I ever did. And I know the feeling. But we must learn not to measure the promises of God against my experience, but in start measuring my experience against his promises. His promises, his word is the standard. That's the one that's the true reality here. And it's, it's our experience that needs to kind of begin to live up to that rather than to bring his word down to the level of my experiences. Which is why Paul says in chapter 7 of 2 Corinthians, he says, since we have these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from every defilement of body and spirit, bringing holiness to completion in the fear of God. We do the work of changing our habits. We do the work of clearing out the things that we have around that are that, that belong to the old, that we, that we know don't help us live the life of God because we cleanse ourselves of these things. Because why? Because we have these promises, beloved. Beloved of God. He's given you promises of a glorious future. So right now, let's step into that and cleanse ourselves from the things that defile us. We have been remade. And that means something. It means, according to Paul, that those who live might, not lo might no longer live for themselves, but for him. Hello. Hello. There's a good question. Who am I living for? Am I living for myself? What am I living for? Have I let the king and his kingdom shape my decisions whose glory is it that really matters to me not only that but can we say as paul did for the love of christ controls us what he means here controlling is this is this is the motivating force this is the wind in his sails this is the tractor beam pulling him in this is the force that compels and propels him is the love of christ that's what Paul is saying. He's been gripped by the love of Christ. And now, wow, that shapes his decisions. He's not looking at anything or anyone the same again. From now on, he says, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh, we regard him thus no longer. He used to look at Christ one way thought he was a prophet or in Paul's case thought he was a false teacher but not now not after the resurrection not after the road to Damascus not after the love of God came to him and spoke to him and forgave him you can't look at Jesus that way any longer we can't look at Jesus that way any longer because of the resurrection we must see him as he truly is the son of God we used to look at outward appearance, Paul says. And we do, don't we? 
We judge on metrics like money and appearance and success and image and status and popularity and power and sexiness and usefulness and acceptability. Do they, <coughs> you know, what will happen if we're, if we're with that person? What will people think of us? How will we be seen? How will we be judged? And we judge them because we, we're worried about how we will be judged. And Jesus said, by the measure you use to judge will be the measure that will be used to judge you. We tend to think and we can easily find ourselves thinking and seeing people in terms of utility. What can I get from this person? Not what can I give and how can I serve and how can I love? And that's, that's the attitude of living for me. You help me, great. If you can't, see you. Yet, God says that's no longer the way we should regard people. That's not how we should see people. People who are made in the image of God, for whom Christ loved and died. I want to see them like that. That's how I forgive. That's how I'll forgive when... I've been hurt. That's how I will love my enemies. That's how I can pray for those who persecute me and bless those who revile me. And that's how I be able to give generously when I'd rather uh, keep. That's where it all starts because we regard no one any longer according to the flesh. We start to see them through the eyes of Christ. So God gives us new eyes, new vision to fit with a new creation. And we see, Lord, don't we see a world that needs reconciling? And the church has been given the message, the task as his ambassadors to make the appeal for God, on God's behalf, to the world. Yet the world so often doesn't want reconciling, it wants affirming, it wants to be justified in its own eyes. It doesn't accept the claims of Christ and so there will, will be those who will refuse the offer who reject the appeal. But like Paul, we implore, we plead. We don't accuse, we don't point the finger, we don't need to shout or abuse. No, no, no. We implore, we, ple we plead, we beg you, we appeal to you, we seek to persuade you because not only has God given us new eyes to see but a new voice with which to speak. And there is much work in reconciliation to be done. Whatever progress we have made as a species, we do not appear to be any more united. We're just as divided as ever we were. Yet in the church, we at least have a hope of seeing a multi-ethnic, multi-generational family, people of all classes, whether rich or poor, male or female, young or old, all finding our place in the household of God. It's one of the things that is so beautiful about Grace Church is the way we begin to see all peoples because Christ died for all, all being reconciled and all being reconciled to each other, finding and seeing in one another whether we understand the language or not as brother and sister in Christ. We begin to see that when we've been reconciled to him, well, we have a chance of being reconciled to each other. And of course we know we can look around at the church and we can look around at places where the church seems to be not just not a force for reconciliation, but a force for division. So it's easier to say than it is to do. I read this in a book this past week and I really liked it. It says, the higher one aspires, the deeper one risks failing. I find it hard to believe, however, that cautious respectability is the answer to the overwhelming problems of today. The higher one aspires, the deeper one risks failing but I find it hard to believe that cautious respectability is the answer to the overwhelming problems of today. That was actually read, uh, written nearly 60 years ago. How much more true is it today? Brothers and sisters, let us not be cautious 
Let us not worry about respectability. Let us aspire to high and lofty goals. Let us invest our lives into the very same thing that Christ invested his life into, the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, dear friends, Grace Church, let us no longer live for ourselves, but for Christ. Let his love compel you, impel and propel you. Let his spirit guide you and lead you. Let us in the next few months be bold and put Christ in the center of our lives. And let's look at people and ask God to show us what do you see? To listen to people and say, God, what do you hear? And to speak to people and say, God, what would you say? For we, we need to remember, we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, Paul says, and each one will receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. One day Jesus will say, even to us, who he has welcomed in, who have trusted him, he will still say, what did you do? What did you do? And I don't want to say I was actually Jesus. I was a bit worried about my respectability. I was a little, that's what I was thinking of. I was thinking about these things and I was cautious. And I remember now, Jesus, the story you told of the one who buried his talents. I don't want that to be me. Let us give a good account of what we have done with the new life he has given us and commend ourselves to God. Brothers and sisters, we're, we are not what we once were. We have died with Christ. And Paul says in Galatians, and I no longer live, but it is Christ who lives in me. We are a new creation. Not so that we can be proud, not so that we can say that we're better than anyone else, not so that we can do any of those things but so that we can give in a way we can never give before all glory to God because we no longer live for ourselves, but we live for him. Encourage one another then, spur one another on towards love and good deeds. This is our great calling and our great joy and our great privilege to say to one another, hey, remember, we're living for Christ. What does God say to you? Have you done it? Come on, I believe in you. And I believe in what God has said to you. We want, to, we want your gifts. We want you to go for it. We want you to not hold back. We want you to trust him, believe for him, because this is the way, this we're being caught up in his renewal of all things. He said, behold, I am making all things new. There's a new heaven and a new earth coming. And for that, they want new people redeemed and restored people to be part who belong in that new creation and we have that joy right now of beginning to be signposts and point people and plead people come join with us in this new creation and give glory to Jesus Christ for what he has done. Amen.